Hello and welcome to this revision session for GCSE Separate Science Physics Paper 1. So in today's revision session we're going to look at how you answer GCSE Physics Examination Style Questions for AQA GCSE Physics Paper 1. So we should be able to answer these styles of questions, then assess your understanding on GCSE Physics, and then understand what topics you need to improve upon for GCSE Physics. So how should you carry out this revision session? Well when you complete this revision session you divide your piece of paper into two sections. Make the section on the left hand side larger than the right hand side and in the left hand side section write down your working out and answers to the question in the revision session. When doing this make sure you write in full sentences and show your full working out. Whilst in the right hand side in this section write down any piece of information which you find useful or any hints and tips on answering questions from this revision session. At the end of this revision session write up these notes into a revision sheet for you to use independently. So let's have a look at a few few questions for GCSE Physics Paper 1. The first topic we're going to look at is energy. So look at the following question. Figure 6 shows how the speed changes as the power output of the cyclist changes. Write down the equation that makes power, time and work done and then calculate the work done by the cyclist when his power output is 200 watts for 1,800 seconds. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, so first thing, it's very, very important you memorize your key equations in GCSE physics. And this one is power is equal to work done divided by time taken. Now, AQA also allow you to write it in symbol form. So you could say P is equal to W over T. Now, this allows you to then answer that second question. So the second question is working out work done. So what AQA suggests that you do in your answer is firstly, sub in the values for power and time. So you know 200, is equal to work done over time which is 1800 now it's important you do this in your first step because it shows AQA and the examiner who's marking it that you can recognize the power term and the time term in the equation you can then rearrange your equation to make work done the subject so it's going to be 200 times by 1800 it's times by 1800 as a rigid divide on the other side of the equals line so when it goes into the other side of the equal sign it will be a times and a divide so you get an answer of 360,000 joules. Now it's very important that for every exam question you do when you calculate a value you check to see if it looks sensible and this looks a sensible value. Next question. Nuclear power stations generate electricity through nuclear fission. Electricity can also be generated by burning shale gas. Shale gas is natural gas trapped in rocks. Shale gas can be extracted by a process called fracking. There is some evidence that fracking causes minor earthquakes. Burning shale gas adds carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Describe the advantages of nuclear power compared with the use of shale gas to generate electricity. And then what is the name of one fuel used in nuclear power stations? So pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answers right so it's very important you learn the advantages and disadvantages of all the different energy resources so we're comparing nuclear against gas in this particular example so let's look at some advantages that no carbon dioxide is emitted when you carry out the nuclear process in the power station so it will not contribute to global warming or climate change then also nuclear powers don't cause earthquakes because you'll notice in the question it tells you that fracking can cause minor earthquakes so while you have to memorize that you can use the information given in the question and finally more energy is released per kilogram of fuel in the nuclear process compared to gas now again it's very important you don't just say more energy you've got to quantify it in terms of how much mass there is as well there so it's more energy released per kilogram now the next question is just a pure factual recall and it's either uranium or plutonium that is the fuel for air nuclear power stations let's look at the following question figure 8 shows the gas boiler used to heat a house Describe how the different energy stores are changed by the boiler. Then to heat the house, the boiler transfers 15 megajoules of energy in 50 in 10 minutes. Calculate the power of the boiler, write down any equation that you use. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. 
Right, so the first thing to note is it gives you lots of information in this question about what's going on inside the gas boiler. So you would start off by saying the chemical energy store of the fuel decreases. Now, it, you write about the fuel because it's signposted to you in the question because they've literally labeled the fuel. Then you would say the thermal energy store of the water increases. We can say this because it goes from cold water to hot water. Once again, it's labeled in the actual diagram. So use the labels to guide you. Then the last one is the thermal energy store of the air increases. Once again, they've signposted this to you because they've labeled the gas as getting hotter. So there is your final answer. Now in this next question, you can see firstly, it's going to be four marks. So this tells us there's a number of key things you've got to do rather than just plug numbers into an equation. So the first thing to note is what's the equation for power? So you've got to recall this and it was in a previous question we previously looked at. Power is equal to work done or energy transferred divided by time taken. Now you'll notice in the values given there's a few tricks because it's 15 megajoules. So we don't just write in 15, we've got to convert megajoules to joules. So we say it's 15 million or 15 times 10 to the 6. Big M means times 10 to the 6. And the second thing to note is it's given in 10 minutes. Now we don't work in minutes in physics, we work in seconds. So we've got to convert our minutes into seconds. So you'll see the first two marks are converting the energy into just joules and the time into seconds we pop our number in and then we um, write the equation out and we find our answer is 25,000 watts once again we check to see if that's a sensible answer let's now have a look at a few questions concerning electricity so let's look at this first question a lamp is connected to a 24 volt power supply the current through the lamp is 1.5 amps calculate the power of the lamp then LED lamps are much more efficient than filament lamps what does this statement mean so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer Right, so first thing we've got to do is, you know, power is equal to potential difference times by current. Pop our values in, show our working out. 1.5 times by 24 is equal to 36 watts and make sure the answer looks sensible. Now, secondly, you've got to know what efficiency means. Now, efficiency means the proportion of useful output energy compared to the total input. Now, it's much more efficient, so it means we've got a lot more useful output, so a lot less wasted output. So the answer is going to be the LED light lamps waste a smaller proportion of the input energy than the filament lamps. This next question says, draw a diagram to show how 1.5 volt cells should be connected together to give a potential difference of 4.5 volts. Use the correct circuit diagram for the cell. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so it's very important you memorize the different circuit symbols in electrical devices. So we've got to draw our correct circuit symbol, which is going to be for a cell, one long line, one small line. We then place them together in series, because when you have things in series, the potential difference adds. So you'll need three of them because 1.5 plus 1.5 plus 1.5 is equal to 4.5 volts. Next question. The plug of an electrical appliance contains a fuse. What is the correct circuit symbol for a fuse? Then the appliance is connected to the mains electrical supply. The mains potential difference is 230 volts. Calculate the energy transferred when 13 coulombs of charge flows through the appliance. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. So once again, it's key and it's crucial that you memorize your key circuit symbol equation uh, symbols. So you've got to know what a fuse is. So just this is just fact. This is memory. It is that particular symbol. Now the second one again, you've got to use your equation, but always show your working out. So you do 13 times by 230, and you get 2,990 joules. Once again, in your answer, show your working out, and then check to see if the answer looks sensible. Next question. Figure 9 shows the structure of a fuse. Write down the equation that links charge flow, current and time. Then the fuse wire melts when 1.52 coulombs of charge flows through the, th flows through the fuse in 0 0.40 seconds. Calculate the current at which the fuse wire melts. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, like we said before, it's key and it's crucial that you memorize your physics equations um, and you can recall them. So we know that um, charge is equal to current times by time, or we can write in symbol form, Q equals IT. Then we can rearrange this equation, but before we do that, we've got to sub in our values. So we say 1.52 is equal to I times by 0 0.40. With that step, you're showing the examiner that you can you know what the values for charge are and the, and the, val and the value for time is. You then rearrange it 
it, so i is equal to 1.52 over 0 0.40. Remember to divide by 0 0.40 because on the other side of the equals, it's times by 0 0.40. So our answer is 3.8 amps. And lastly, we check our answer. Does it look sensible? 3.8 amps looks about right, so it probably will be. Next question. Write down the equation that links energy transfer, power and time. Then the power output of the immersion heater is 5,000 watts. Calculate the time taken for the immersion heater to transfer 4,070,000 joules of energy. Pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. So like we said before, you've got to learn your equations. Power is equal to energy transferred over time, or power is equal to work done over time. Energy transferred, power, they mean the same thing. So power is equal to energy divided by time, or P equals ET. So once again, we pop our values into the equation so we know uh, that to the examiner that we know what power is and we know what time is. Now, luckily for us in this question, um, power is given in watts, energy is given in joules, no conversion is needed. So it's 5,000 is equal to 4 million and 70,000 divided by time. Now you make time the subject, show clearly you're working out, so time is therefore equal to 814. And then again, what's our units of use for time in all situations in physics? It's going to be seconds, so there we get our final answer. A student investigated how the resistance of a piece of nichrome wire varies with length. Figure 3 shows part of the circuit that the student used. Describe how the student would obtain the data needed for the investigation and your answer should include one a risk assessment for the hazard of the investigation. Pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Now, again, when you're writing about an investigation, it's really important you talk about the following what your independent variable is, how you would vary it, and what you'd measure that variance with. Then you would look at your dependent variable and what you'd measure those values with, how you then use your information there to draw your to get your conclusion. So what we'd do is we'd measure the length with a ruler and we get different measurements of length, state those measurements, tell the examiner what values you would use. Uh, just as long as it's sensible, it's okay. You then say you measure current with what device, an ammeter, potential difference measured with a voltmeter. Then you try and just make sure you get a good experiment technique so you could say turn off the air power supply when you're not taking a reading or repeat the readings and then take an average you can then calculate resistance for each length give the equation potential difference over current you then plot a graph of resistance against length now a hazard is something that could be an issue in the investigation that could cause you harm so the most likely cause of harm is a high current as that could possibly lead to the wire overheating or melting which can cause you to burn now always again state the actual impact to you as the experimenter what is the actual risk Risk of the hazard. So as a result, how can you minimise that? Handle with care is one answer, uh, turn it off when you're not using another answer, or the easiest one to say is use a low current as it's less likely to cause this heat effect. Next question. A distiller is connected to the mains by a three-core cable. The wires are covered by different coloured insulation. What colour is the insulation covering each of the wires in which statement gives the purpose of the earth wire? So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so you've got to memorise the different colours of the wires and the, dip, the uses of each wire. So the first thing you've got to know is a live wire is brown, it's just a fact. A neutral wire is blue, it's just a fact. And the earth wire is green and yellow stripes. It's just a fact you've got to remember. Now the next thing you've got to memorise is the purpose of the earth wire, the purpose of the live wire, the purpose of the neutral wire. It carries an alternating potential difference. That is the live wire. It melts if the current is the surface too high. That's actually the fuse. It provides a connection to complete the circuit. That's the neutral wire. But it stops the casing of the appliance from becoming live. That is the earth wire. Next question. The heating element has a power of 2.5 kilowatts and the resistance of the heating element is 17 ohms. Calculate the current in the heating element and give your answer to two significant figures. So pause the video now. Then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, so it's five marks, so it tells us we're going to have to use uh, either a combination of uh, equations or we can use an equation which is quite complex. So we've been given power, we've been given resistance, we need to work out current. So the equation you would use is P is equal to I squared R. Now, therefore, we rearrange this and make I the subject. So I is equal to the square root of P, power, over R, resistance. Now, we know the power should be in watts, not kilowatts, like is stated in the question. So we've always got to check that. So it's 2.5 kilowatts is equal to 2,500 watts. We then plug our numbers in. So I is equal to the square root of 2,500 over 17. So you get 12.126781. 
from our calculator, but we need to give our answer to two significant figures. So you start counting the number of significant figures with the first non-zero number. The first non-zero number given in that, num in that value is 1. So you go 1, 2, there's your first two significant figures, so the answer is 12 amps. Checking that you don't have to round up, by the way. Next question. A student investigated how the length affects the resistance of a wire. Figure 1 shows the circuit the student used. The student took measurements using the meters X and Y. Name the meters X and Y. Pause the video now, then unpause the video to go through the answers. Well, it's very important you know that in electrical circuits, you've got to connect the ammeter, which measures the current, in series because it's measuring the flow of the charge, so that will be X. Whilst we've got to place the voltmeter in parallel with the device being measured because the voltmeter measures potential difference, the difference, so it's got to measure the potential before the component and the potential after the component, so it's got to straddle that component in parallel. Next question. Write down the equation that links current, potential difference and resistance. The potential difference across a piece of wire is 2.1 volts. The current in the wire is 0 0.30 amps. Calculate the resistance of the wire. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so it's very important, once again, you memorize your key equations. So we know that potential difference is equal to current times resistance, or V is equal to IR. Current having the symbol I, potential difference having the symbol V. Now, we can then use this to work out our next answer, which is why it's so important you memorize your equations. Otherwise, you can't then access the, access the next equation. So we then pop our values in. We say R is equal to V over I. We then write down 2.1 over 0 0.30. This is a nice question because there's no prefixes or weird units. We've just got our nice easy units of volts and amps. So it's 2.1 over 0 0.3 is equal to 7.0 ohms. Once again, you check. Does that look like a sensible number? Yes, it does. It's probably right. Next question. Calculate the charge that flows through the cell in one minute. Each filament lamp has a power of 3 watts and a resistance of 12 ohms. Give the unit of your answer. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, so again, it's a six mark question. So this is telling us it's going to involve either multiple equations or it's going to involve a complex equation. Now you're given time, you're given power, and you're given resistance, and you need to work out charge. Now we know that if you have power, and resistance, you can work out current because current like power is equal to I squared R. So if we can work out current with that equation, we can then use that and the time to work out charge, which is why it's always very important to know all your different equations. So power is equal to I squared R, so 3 is equal to I squared times by 12. We then we then rearrange in square root to make it I is equal to square root 3 over 12, so I is equal to 0 0.5 amps. We then know charge is equal to current current times by time, so then it's 0 0.5 times by 60. Now what's important to note is it gives you the time in minutes. It says one minute, but we never use minutes in physics, we use seconds. So you've always got to convert your minutes into seconds. So your answer would be 60 coulombs. Now again, this is why it's important, you can always memorize your key um, units, so you can, you can put them into your answers where needed, so the charge is 60 coulombs. Let's now have a look at a few questions regarding atomic structure. So, a teacher uses a Geiger-Muller tube and counter to measure the number of counts in 60 seconds for radioactive rock. The counter recorded 819 counts in 60 seconds. The background count rate was 0 0.30 counts per second. Calculate the count rate for the rock. A householder is then worried about the radiation emitted by the granite worktop in his kitchen. One kilogram of granite has an activity of 1,250 becquerels. The workshop has a mass of 150 uh, kilograms. Calculate the activity of the, work the kitchen worktop in becquerels. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Answer. So firstly, how do you work out count rate? Well, rate means per second, per time. So if you do your counts divided by your time in seconds, that will get you the count rate in total. So the count rate in total for the room is going to be 819 divided by 60. But that's for the entire room. But we want it for just the rock. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to subtract the count rate, which is in the background anyway. So we do that 13.65, which is the total count rate, minus that background count rate, so we get our answer of 13.35. 
The next question is a bit of mathematics, but you've just, which you have to memorize an equation for, you've just got to use your logic. And that is, if one kilogram gives 1,250 becquerels, 180 kilograms will be have that value times by 180. So you work it through and you get 225,000 becquerels. Let's look at the next question. Figure 5 shows the number of americium nuclei in a sample changing with time. How many years does it take for the number of americium nuclei to decrease from 10,000 to 5,000? What is the half-life of americium? So pause the video now, then unpause the video to go through your answer. Right, so it's very, very, very important that you've just got to use the graph when given in a question to work out your answer. So we've started at 10,000, and you look at 10,000, the time is zero. You then go across to 5,000, go along the line and go down, and you'll notice the answer is 430, because then it's 430 minus zero, so your answer would equal 430. Now to go from 10,000 to 5,000 is halving, the value, so that is the half-life, because the half-life is the time it takes for the value to drop by half. So an example of a half-life is 10,000 to 5,000. So the answer is the same again, 430 years, or whatever answer you got previously. Next question. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope with a half-life of 5,730 years. A sample of, of carbon-14 from a fossilised tree gives a count rate of 20 decays per second. The tree died 17,190 years ago. Determine what the count rate of the carbon-14 isotope was when the tree died. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, so firstly, it's very important you work out how many half-lives have taken place. So, if you had a die 17,190 years ago, and then one half-life is 5,730 years, divide one by the other, and we get three half-lives. Now, it's important to note that it is getting, it will go back in time, so instead of halving the values, we're doubling the values. So you start off with that, that value in the, in the present, 20, and we're going backwards in time, so it's 20 times by 2 is 40, 40 times by 2 is uh, going to be 80. 80 times by 2 is 160. So the answer is 160. Why did I double it three times? Because there's been three half-lives. Next question. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. Carbon-14 is used for carbon dating. Carbon dating can tell us how old some objects are. A skeleton was carbon dated. The results show that there was only 12.5% of the original amount of carbon-14 left in the skeleton. Calculate the age of the skeleton. Pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, so what you've got to again work out is how many half-lives have taken place. Now, when you started it, when, this, when the thing died, it was going to be 100% of carbon-14. So now what you've got to do is you've got to take 100% and then half it until you get to 12.5%. So 100 halved is 50, 50 halved is 25, 25 halved is 12.5, which is what is stated in the question. So we've halved it three times. So that tells us there have been three half-lives, because half-life is the time it takes to half. So therefore, there have been three three half-lives. Each half-life is 5,730 years and it's constant, so therefore you multiply by three to so get 17,190 years. Next question. Figure four shows how the activity of radium will change. Determine the half-life of radium and show your working out. Then radium was discovered by Marie Curie in 1898. The notebooks she used were contaminated with radium and are still hazardous. Explain why the notebooks are still hazardous. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, so once again you need to work out half-life and you've got to use the graph. So you pick two numbers, one half the other, and then you work out what the half-life is. Now you'll notice in this question, and it'll be a very easy mistake to make, is it actually doesn't start at 180,000. It starts at about 184, 85,000, just above it slightly. So actually that value halved isn't going to be 90,000, it's going to be about 92,000. So as a result you take it at just that value above, you then go to about 90. 2,000 becquerels, you go across, you read down the line, you find the difference between the two numbers, the first one's at zero, the second one's at about 1,600, so the answer is 1,600 years. Now the next thing to note is 
Why are there notebooks still hazardous? Now, this occurred, she, Marie Curie used these notebooks approximately 120 years ago, because we're now in the 21st century. So only about 120 years have passed. But we know it takes 1,600 years for the activity to drop by half, not even completely disappear, just to drop by half. So if there's been only 1,000, sorry, if there's only been 120 years past, and there's a half-life a lot longer, therefore the activity will not have dropped by much. So it's still very hazardous. Next question. Explain how the properties of alpha, beta and gamma radiation affect the level of the hazard at different distances. Pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answer. Right, so again, it's very important you do a couple of things. Firstly, we talk about alpha, we talk about beta, and we talk about gamma, and then we link it into a conclusion, because it asks us to talk about the level of hazard at different distances. So we should really segment this out into paragraphs to show a logical order, talking about alpha, then beta, then gamma, then a final paragraph to sum everything up. So let's have a look at the answer. So alpha is the least penetrating, but the most ionizing and has the sh shortest range in the air, a couple of centimetres before it gets stopped by the air. Beta is the second most penetrating and the second most ionising, has the second longest range and can only travel a few metres in air. Whilst gamma is the most penetrating, it's the least ionising and has the greatest range because it can travel in air for an infinite distance. Really, it's only reduced by things such as concrete and lead. So therefore, there's our different properties of alpha, beta and gamma, each segmented into different places so we can then have our structure into our answer and finally we've got to relate it back to the question asked what's the hazard of the different uh, radioactive emissions at different distances so alpha is most dangerous very close up so about centimeters away from a source beta is then the most dangerous a few meters away from the source at medium range because the alpha has now disappeared because it's been stopped after a few centimeters and then finally at a long range on the order of kilometers and such gamma is the only dangerous one because the other two have been stopped next question Table 3 shows the half lives of two radioisotopes that contaminated the environment. A soil sample was taken from the area around Chernobyl in 1986. The soil sample was contaminated with equal amounts of cesium and iodine. Explain how the risk linked to each isotope has changed between 1986 and 2018. Both isotopes emit the same type of radiation. And determine the year where the activity of cesium in the soil sample will be 1 32th of its original value. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answers. Right, so you've been given information in a table, and in a physics exam, if you're given a graph or you're given a table, use the information in the table. So it tells you straight away that the half-life of iodine is very short, whilst the half-life of cesium is very long on the scale from 1986 to 2018. So that tells us that the iodine will have, have its risk or its activity decreased by a large amount because it's got a very, very short half-life. Now, don't say it's disappeared because in theory, it'll never fully disappear, only go to very small more values then finally the cesium will not have decreased by much because it's got quite a long half-life only approximately one half-life has passed so there's still quite a lot of activity there so the risk still stands now the next question is asking you to work out the year of when the activity of the soil sample of cesium will be 1 32th of its original value. So the first thing you've got to do is work out how many half-lives will have to take place to get to 1 32th. So you'll start off with just saying there's 1 or 100%. You then half it, so you go 1 half is a half, half half is a fourth, it's a quarter, sorry, a quarter half is an eighth. An eighth half is a sixteenth, and a sixteenth half is a thirty-tooth. So therefore, how many times did we actually half it? We halved it five times. So that tells us there must have been five half-lives. Now, when you look at the actual graph of the information given in the question, one half-life of cesium is 30 years, and that's a constant value. So therefore, that can't change. So if there's been five half-lives, and each half-life takes 30 years, well, then the entire time for this to take place is 150 years. But that's not what the question is asking you. The question is asking you in what year will this take place? Now it said in the question that the uh, the initial value was taken in 1986. So we know that we've got to add 150 years to 1986 which will be the year 2136 
which is our final answer. So that brings an end to our revision session today. So hopefully if you've been successful and learned today's revision session, you should be able to answer GCSE ex uh, physics examination style questions, assess your understanding of GCSE physics, and then understand what topics you need to improve upon for GCSE physics. Thank you very much for watching this video on GCSE uh, Separate Science Physics Paper 1 and have a lovely day.